Bible tonight, and I hope you do, you can turn to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 1 6. Genesis 16. <clears throat> This is the record of the birth of Ishmael. And we read in Genesis 16, 1, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. I want us to pray a moment, and then I want to share some thoughts from this incident. Our Heavenly Father, just want to thank you tonight. I want to look to you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for how you use the scripture in our personal lives. And we pray for that to be the case this evening. Lord, make it to practical. Uh, may you use it to just make any changes in our thinking, and in our life that uh, you desire. Lord, we thank you for just the practicality of the lessons from daily life that we can get from your word. We pray that the end result would be that you'd be glorified by lives that you change, by hearts that you work in, uh, lives that redound and show forth your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In the first uh, three verses of Genesis chapter 16, I see just a real picture of human manipulation. You know, we human beings, we are experts at manipulating. We know how to make things happen, or at least try to make things happen. But as in this case, whenever we manipulate situations, whenever we try to make things happen in our own power, in our own, in our own strength, it doesn't turn out well. Things go badly. Those of you that are parents, and even if you're not, if you've observed children, you know parent, uh, uh, children are great manipulators. They know just how to manipulate their parents. I mean, they can play a mom against the dad and uh, get what they want, right? Uh, you've probably watched them. Maybe you've experienced it in your own, with your own children in the grocery store when they want something badly and how they play up with the, man, with the manipulation. Well, it just comes natural. And here in Genesis 16, is a record of a believer that badly wants God's will, but begins to panic because time is running out. And so these believers come up with an alternative plan. Sarah is desperate. And I call what she does, the plan that she comes up with, a Hagar moment. I want us to look at it by, first of all, going back for a moment to chapter 15. One chapter back, God meets Abram in a wonderful way. And it says in verse 4, in answer to Abram's question to the Lord, 
you've given me no seed. You don't have, you haven't given me a child like you've promised me originally. And uh, he says in 15.3, one born in my house is mine heir. And he's talking about his, his favorite servant. And here's what God said in 15.4. The word of the Lord came unto him saying, this shall not be thine heir. He that shall come forth out of thine own vow shall be thine heir. And then he brought Abram forth. He said, look now toward heaven. Tell the stars if you are able to number them. And he said, so, so shall thy seed be. You remember in chapter 12, when God originally called Abram out of the Ur of the Chaldees, he told him that he was going to give him a child, that in fact, he was going to give him descendants that would be innumerable. If you could count the stars of the heavens, then that's the equivalent. And so after years of waiting, Abram suggests, uh, suggests to God in this 15th chapter a way that perhaps that promise that God gave him would be fulfilled. Look, it was a cultural norm. We will just use my servant and uh, we'll make his son uh, or him to be our heir. And God uh, said, no, that's not the way it's going to work. God answered Abram's question about uh, a child and then quietly assured him that even though he's getting to be an old man, he still specifically promises Abraham that Abraham, you yourself will produce a child. Well, at least 10 years have passed since that occasion. And you'll note in the 16th chapter that we've just read that uh, even though it was a legal custom of the culture of that day, it was an approved thing in the culture. And I'm sure the pressure was being felt by Sarah, because she didn't have a child, and that was a that was a disgrace in that culture, and so with that added pressure, they come up with this plan that Abram agrees to. What it really reveals is an impatience with God's plan, with God's will. What it amounts to is running ahead of God, and. Uh, improvising, I guess you would say, in order to make happen what God has promised. God never needs our help to accomplish his will. God simply asks for his people to cooperate with him and patiently wait for him to fulfill his promises his way and in his time. It's really one thing to believe God's promise, and it's another thing to wait for its fulfillment. I think we need to believe that God's delays are not God's denials. So there is really impatience on the part of Sarah that Abraham goes along with. And she influences him. And uh, I get the impression in verse 2, look at it again, where she says to her husband, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing, that she's not just recognizing that God's the giver of children. I know she knows that. But perhaps inherent in that statement, she's blaming God for her failure to bear children her failure to have that son. And so she's rushing ahead with her own plan. It's really a classic example of seeking to manipulate the will of God to your advantage. You know, in football, doing an end around. That's what she's doing to the plan and will of God. Uh, to think that we have to help God because it's not happening the way we thought it should happen or when it should happen. And so they're scheming on her part. 
And really what it amounts to, it's a breakdown of trusting God, of depending upon God. And really it's an evidence then that her main concern is not for God's will, not for God's glory, but rather what pleases her, what benefits her and her husband and not mainly the glory of God. Well, there's always consequences for that kind of manipulation. And I didn't read the whole uh, chapter here, but after uh, Hagar flees from Sarah's and Abram's house, remember she's confronted by the angel of the Lord. And notice what he says to her, beginning of verse nine, return to your mistress, submit thyself under her hands, and the angel of the Lord said, I will multiply your seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And he said, behold, you're with child. You're going to bear a son. Call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And notice verse 12. Here's what your son's going to be like. He's going to be a wild man. He's going to be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him and he'll dwell in the presence of all his brethren. There are consequences, obviously, for manipulation or attempted ma manipulation of God's will. She makes a terrible mess of things, her and Abram, because they simply failed to wait on God and sought to manufacture for themselves what God had already promised them that he would do for them. The problem that they produced was huge family problems, huge family problems. You know what happens in that family. And then also long-standing, far-reaching world historic events spun off of this manipulation, the consequences of it. We call it today the Arab-Israeli conflict. And it's a result of Ishmael and Isaac's seed in conflict with another. So in our zeal to see God fulfill his promises to us, we better be careful not to have and create a Hagar moment in our lives. Someone said this, whatever man does without God, he must fail miserably or he must succeed more miserably. Question, why is God waiting so long to fulfill his promise to this husband and wife? Well, the Bible gives, yeah. He's testing their faith. He's testing their faith. I mean, to the max, because when we put together a couple of scriptures, and I'll, you don't have to turn to them, I'm going to read them to you. Listen to this. This is Hebrews 11 and verse 12. It says, Through faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, sprang there even of one and him as good as dead as many as the stars of the sky in multitude. And listen to this. This is Romans, and this is chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. And being not weak in faith, he, Abram, considered not his own body now dead when he was about a 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Why did God wait so long to fulfill the promise to this husband and wife? So that it would be physically impossible for them to have children. Why would he want it to be physically impossible for them to have a kid? So that he would utterly break the self-life in them so that he would crush flesh dependence in their life, so that in the end, only God would get the glory, because it would be totally without 
human ability. Are you willing to believe God and patiently wait for his time and his way? And if you wonder why the wait, it's because God is seeking to break your flesh dependence and to build up your trust, your dependence upon him through waiting. You remember what James says in the first chapter? When you fall into all kinds of testings, count it all joy. Because the testing of your faith works patience or endurance. God's building you because when patience has its perfect work, then you become perfect and you become complete. Lacking nothing. God's seeking to break self-dependence. That's why we are waiting for things perhaps that we know he's even promised to give us so that we might learn to completely depend upon him. You know what, folks? This is the very basics and the essence of the Christian life. If we don't get this, we don't understand what Christianity is about. Living the Christian life is total dependence upon God. And sometimes it's strict lessons like this, severe testings like this, to get us to that place where our flesh dependence is broken, where all we can do is depend upon him. Sarah wanted to build a family. In fact, that's even in the verb form in, uh, I, uh, in I think, verse 2. She wanted to build a family. You remember the psalmist? Psalm 127. How does it go? Say it. That's 27. 127. If the Lord builds the house, right? If I build the house, I labor what? It's futile. Sarah wanted to build the house. But if we try to build the house, it's in vain. God's the only one that can build the house. He's the only one that can keep what is built. That's the essence of Psalm 127. Let me close with this question. Why do you believe God saved you? And I'm not talking about the purpose. But why do you believe that's true, that God saved you? It's because that's what the Bible says, right? But as many as received him, to them he gives the power to become the, the sons or the children of God. Why do you believe that God has saved you? Because he's promised it. Well, has God promised you something? And are you believing him for it? Or are you seeking to manipulate things to make happen what God's promised already to you? Listen to this. This is an a priori argument that Paul uh, gives us in Romans 8.32. Here's what he says. He, God, that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Okay, he's done a great thing for us. The greatest thing in all the world. He gave his only begotten son on our behalf. He delivered him up for us. The next part of the verse says, then how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? The argument is, if God's done the greatest thing, met the biggest and greatest need in our life, salvation, by delivering up his son on our behalf, then why can't we trust him for the rest of the stuff? Everything else is little in comparison to that, right? So, we've all had our Hagar moments, but... Those kinds of times never end well. And it seems like we end up having to keep taking the test over and over again. You know, what I, you know what I mean? I mean, when you take a test in school, when you took a test, weren't you glad? Wasn't it a relief when it was over? You, don't want to, you didn't want to come back and take that test again, did you? Let's learn. Let's learn 
through the tests that God gives us. Let's let God teach us. Let's not try to manipulate what we know to be the promise, the will and way, uh, way of God. Let's not try to twist that to make things happen our way in our time. Trust God. Don't give in to those Hagar moments, right?